Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Abundant Life. I'm Johnette Benkovic. Almost every one of you watching today has a mother or a sister, an aunt or a friend who has had breast cancer. Perhaps you yourself have battled this disease in the past or have been recently diagnosed. Breast cancer is the most common cause of cancer death in American women ages 20 to 59. And in the United States, nearly one out of every eight women will develop breast cancer over the course of her lifetime. Throughout the world, the rate of breast cancer has been steadily increasing over the last four decades, and its rate has increased even faster in more developed countries. What is causing this increase? Are there factors that have been previously overlooked? What are new studies revealing? Our guests today will provide us with answers to these questions and share with us some astonishing research about the connection of breast cancer, abortion, and the birth control pill. You won't want to miss today's informative and eye-opening program. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Living His Life Abundantly International presents The Abundant Life with Johnette Bankovic. Is there a link between breast cancer and abortion and breast cancer and the birth control pill? After six years of analyzing the data contained within hundreds of medical studies that pertain to these two questions, our first guest has concluded that both an induced abortion and use of the birth control pill are independent risk factors for the development of breast cancer, especially if the woman has participated in either of these factors at a young age. The fact that few women have been informed of this link is, in his opinion, a very, very serious mistake with worldwide implications. Here to discuss with us about the relationship between breast cancer, abortion, and the birth control pill is Dr. Chris Callenborn, author of the book Breast Cancer, It's Link to Abortion and the Birth Control Pill. Let's welcome Dr. Chris Callenborn. Dr. Callenborn, welcome to The Abundant Life. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you with us to discuss this very important issue. And as a woman, it's an issue that's very close to my heart. We see so many women developing breast cancer today. And the fact that there is a link between breast cancer and abortion and breast cancer and the birth control pill, and the fact that that link has not really been disclosed mm. so that women are aware of this link is very upsetting to me as a woman and I'm sure to our viewers today. For us to understand this link, it's important for us to have some kind of knowledge about the way in which breast cancer begins to develop within a woman to begin with. Can you share with us about the way in which breast cancer begins in a woman's sure. breast? Just to put it in a simple sort of model, um, a woman, especially before she's had children, has breast cells that are immature. And those breast cells, through pregnancy, get exposed to different hormones. And they're estradiol, progesterone, and HCG. And without getting too technical, those hormones get your breast cells to get ready to produce milk. Once you produce milk, you're far less likely to be susceptible to breast cancer. And that's why women, for example, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when the bomb dropped, it was women who did not have children who tended to get breast cancer later on. So when a woman has an abortion or takes the birth control pill before she has children, that's the worst possible time for her to do so. And um, both the pill and abortion have their the greatest risk then, even though they have a risk later on after pregnancy also. We have a, a, a graphic that illustrates for us the way in which a woman's breast does begin to mature through the process of pregnancy and then through lactation or as she produces milk and begins to nurse her baby. We're going to bring that graphic up and as we bring it up, can you tell us what it is that we're looking at so that we can have a, a picture portrayal of that developing breast? Um, well, what we're looking at here 
is a picture of the, f the top picture is breast cells or our breast cells <clears throat> prior to a woman's pregnancy. And a group of researchers called Rousseau and Rousseau, a husband-wife team who are very brilliant from Philadelphia, did these models on rats. And what they found is if you look at the first top portion, those cells are immature, they haven't divided, they're susceptible to cancer-producing agents called carcinogens. Once a woman has her baby, you can see those cells turn into grape-like cr uh, clusters. And they're much less susceptible to cancer-producing agents. Um, basically, once, once they go through those stages, through the nine months, they're less susceptible. And then when you breastfeed, they're even more, even less susceptible to carcinogens after that. So um, part of the reason they're so susceptible is when you go from the top to the bottom picture, the breast cells are dividing. And whenever a breast cell divides, the DNA divides and you have mitosis, you can get what's called a DNA error. That's why if you take the pill before you've had kids or an abortion, those breast cells are very vulnerable and you can cause what's called DNA errors. Once you've had kids, you can still get breast cancer, but it's far less likely. Let's talk about the way in which mm -hmm. those uh, particular hormones that you mentioned, estrogen, progesterone, and HCG, what happens when a woman gets pregnant and that those uh, hormones begin that cell differentiation, that maturing process, mm -hmm. and then suddenly it's interrupted? Well, that would be the case in an abortion. What happens is a woman's estrogen or estradiol levels they go way, way up when you're pregnant, and so do progesterone. And the highest or most important hormone that I'm aware of is HCG. And those hormones go up, sometimes 10, 20, 30-fold or more. And what happens if a woman were to have an abortion at maybe 10 weeks of gestational age, those hormones come crashing down. That's called a hormonal blow. So the cells which started dividing are basically in a frozen or very vulnerable state where the DNA is not really sure what to do. It doesn't know what to do. And so let's say a woman were to have an abortion at <clears throat> age 18 and then not have kids till 28. Those are 10 years where her cells are susceptible to carcinogens. Mm. And that's why it's so bad. Now, how does the birth control pill impact on those estrogen and progesterone and HCG levels? Well, the birth control pill does two things. The first thing that people aren't aware of is that the birth control pill at times actually causes an early abortion. And that's not a religious statement. It's not a Catholic statement. That was uh, medically documented in the archives of family medicine February 2000 by a very um, bright man named Walt Laramore and Joe Stanford. <clears throat> so the pill by causing an early abortion, we don't know how often, could upset the hormones of a woman like an induced abortion does. The real reason the pill probably causes breast cancer is that if a woman were to take the pill and you take a biopsy of her breast cells, they start dividing more rapidly. And, you know, I tell my audiences, um, if you were, like, I Love Lucy, the, the, the show where Ethel and Lucy were trying to make the chocolates and the assembly line, you know, sped up, the product's going to come out bad. And the same thing with breast cells. If you speed up any cell, you're going to get DNA errors. So that a woman who takes the birth control pill before she's had kids we're showing our data has at least a 40, probably 45% increased risk in breast cancer. Hmm. I mean, that's tremendous. And the question that comes into my mind and hmm. really has uh, a great concern, I think, for many of our viewers today is the fact that within our school systems, uh, many times without parents being aware of it, girls, uh, daughters, uh, granddaughters are being uh, given birth control pills or have accessibility to birth control pills. and these young women at a very young age have begun to become involved in oral contraceptives without obviously having children at that point and also young women are getting abortions at younger and younger ages mm -hmm. so what we're seeing is that potentially within a very short period of time uh, after uh, there's enough time for for the um, vulnerability of those uh, of that breast tissue to begin to form cancer, we may see in another 20, 30 years an explosion of breast cancer in the United States. Well, we're already seeing it. The numbers in the last five years have gone to 175,000 women who develop breast cancer in the U.S. alone, 
and breast cancer is the number one cancer in, in the world in women. So in the U.S. alone, we've gone from 175,000 to 192,000 just the last few years. The mortality is actually decreasing because of better medicines, but the numbers are increasing. And, um, you know, we have to explain how these numbers are going up, and they're going up in almost every Western country in the world. And there's only four factors that do this, but one is that women are having fewer children. Having children protects you from breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, every time you have a child, your risk of breast and ovarian cancer go down by about 10%. Breastfeeding protects you from breast, uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, but abortion and the pill worsen your risk. So we have to try to figure out, you can't say it's all due to abortion or the pill, but some of it probably is. Mm -hmm. What I hear you saying then is that women who never have children have a higher incidence of breast cancer. And also, uh, what about women who have a miscarriage prior to their first full-time pregnancy? Right. Women in general who do not have children have an increased risk as you were saying that's why some people have called breast cancer the nuns disease because nuns tend to have an increased risk as far as miscarriage miscarriage in general does not carry an increased risk some of the data that I'm reviewing shows that if you have if you miscarry your first baby there is a slight increased risk and that's going to be studied more but it looks like induced abortion is the worst and the birth control pill miscarriage not so much because of a number of reasons one is Often women miscarry and then they have a baby right away. And the second thing is hormone levels don't go as high when you have a miscarriage. But um, I'm showing some increased risk with an early miscarriage of your first baby. Mm -hmm. Let's talk for a moment about the way in which these studies are conducted. And I know that in many of the different studies, there is a tendency to go back and to use studies that happened years ago, like mm -hmm. in the 60s or the 70s, um, as opposed to using later studies that are in the 80s mm -hmm. or the 90s. Mm -hmm. Why does that make a difference in the way in which the outcome of the research would read? Well, um, one of the frustrating things is women do not really hear what's happening and it's it, it kind of relates to the point you made there's really no such thing as informed consent and we can get to that later but what's happening is the average doctor with the pill will tell his patient or her patient the pill does not really increase breast cancer based on the Oxford pooled analysis which came out in 1996 which basically pooled all the world data that did not show much of an increased risk Unfortunately, what they don't tell the patient is some of that data came from as early as the 1930s, before the pill even came out. And also, if you take studies from the 60s and 70s, if the pill were to come out in 1960, you know, would you expect much in 1970? So out of all the studies before 1980, <clears throat> I would say maybe about 5% of them showed an increased risk, but 18 out of 22 studies show that if you take the pill before you've had kids, the studies since 1980, that the risk is at least 40%, and our paper should come out within a year, it'll probably be closer to 45%. Is there a relationship between the number of years you take the birth control pill or the number of abortions you have and the increased risk of breast cancer? Yes. If you take the pill for longer periods of time, and by the way, it doesn't matter if you took the higher dose birth control pill, the lower dose birth control pill, or the middle dose. The lower dose pills actually could be worse for you because they have a higher, more potent progestin. That's one part of the birth control pill. So, um, what was the question again? I was asking if you, uh, t does it matter the length of time that you take the birth control pill or the number of abortions that you have? To what extent does what that extent? increase the risk of breast cancer, if at all? Right. A woman named Isabel Rameau showed that if you take the pill before you've had kids for four years or more, it's about a 72% increased risk. And Dr. Brin will probably talk to you about that if you do have one abortion, there's an increased risk. But if you have two, it appears that it increases your risk, but it doesn't double your risk. So you might expect the risk to go from 30 to 60 percent. It might just go from 30 to 40 percent. What about the age of uh, a young person who would begin? We've mentioned that in younger women that the risk is increased even more. 
in general, the younger you are, the, inc the higher the risk. And what Janet Dolling showed, if we talk about abortion and breast cancer for a moment, is that if you're 18 or under and you have an abortion, the risk goes to about 150%. And, but if you're 18 and you abort a baby that's past nine weeks in gestational age, it goes up to 800%. Excuse me? Yeah. Would you repeat that again? Yeah. It, Janet Daling, who is pro-choice and has had uh, has two sisters who have breast cancer, showed in her study in 1994 that in general, an abortion causes about a 50% increased risk in breast cancer. But if you're under 18, it goes to 150%. And if you're under 18 and you abort a baby that's nine weeks old or older, it goes to 800%. 800%. And... If you're under 18 and your mom had breast cancer and you get an abortion, according to her study, you're at infinite risk. And what that means is 12 women who had abortions, who had a family history of breast cancer, all 12 out of 12 developed breast cancer before the age of 45. My goodness. Well, those are startling statistics and statistics that certainly open our eyes. And friends, when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion. We will have with us via satellite, Dr. Joe will bring his research on this issue is considered to be the most prominent and the most meticulous. Stay with us. Hello friends, I am so pleased to offer you my new book, Grace-Filled Moments, a unique combination of quotations, scripture passages, prayers, and questions for reflection, all aimed to help you discover the rich treasure of authentic femininity and spiritual motherhood. Whether you use it individually or in a small group setting, my prayer is that Grace-Filled Moments will help you live the abundant life of Jesus Christ as the woman God created you to be. To order, call us at one 800 558 by four, five, two. I am excited to offer you one of our newest resources. Growing in Holiness is a do-it-at-home retreat designed for your personal use or to use in a small group setting. This audio retreat presents nine ways to grow in holiness and features two audio cassettes plus a study guide packaged in an attractive album. Growing in Holiness is sure to jumpstart your spiritual journey and lead you into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. To order, call us at 1-800-558-5452. Hello, friends. I hope you're benefiting from the Abundant Life program that you are watching today. We never cease to be amazed at the way in which the Lord uses this program to reach into the hearts of His people. We get letters from people all over the world who share with us how these programs have ministered to their hearts. We'd like you to join us in this evangelistic outreach. Would you consider making a pledge or a donation to Living His Life Abundantly? Call us at 1-800-558-LHLA and we'll tell you how. <music> In 1996, a team of medical doctors and researchers conducted the most prominent and meticulous meta-analysis in the medical literature on breast cancer risk due to induced abortion. These investigators reported a conservative increased risk of 50% to women who had had an induced abortion prior to their first full-term pregnancy, and a 30% increased risk for women who had had an induced abortion after their first full-term pregnancy. Here to discuss this study, its findings, and the subsequent controversy regarding it is Dr. Joel Brind, one of the original researchers and founder of the Breast Cancer Prevention Institute. He's joining us by satellite today from New York City. Dr. Brind, welcome to The Abundant Life. It's good to have you with us today. Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Well, thank you. This is such a very important topic that we're discussing today. And you, in 1996, have done so much to give us insight into the truth about the link between breast cancer and birth control and breast cancer and abortion. As we begin to discuss your findings, can you tell us first, what is a meta-analysis? A meta-analysis is a compilation of individual studies that pools the data, pools the numbers of women studied so that one can get a higher degree of statistical power, more certainty as to what the result is, because 
uh, in factors which affect the risk of breast cancer in a magnitude of 30% or 50% instead of uh, 500 or 1,000 percent, you need large numbers to be certain that your numbers aren't merely chance fluctuations. What was it that propelled you into research in this area? Well, I had been researching breast cancer, among other diseases related to sex hormones, for uh, about 10 years, back in 1992, when uh, it came to my attention through one of the weekly publications that there was uh, work being done in California about the protective effect of pregnancy and breast cancer. In other words, having babies is good for women. It lowers the risk of breast cancer. But this particular article neglected to say it had to be a full-term pregnancy. And that uh, omission prompted me to go back to the medical literature to see if, in fact, I had remembered correctly and it did need to be a full-term pregnancy. And not only did that convince me that, uh, yes, that was the truth, but in the ensuing 10 years between 1982 and 1992, there had been enough studies published around the world to convince me that induced abortion was itself a risk factor for breast cancer on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was being rather assiduously uh, covered up by uh, institutional medicine and medical research, which clearly did not want this to come out. Let's talk about that cover-up for a moment. Why do you think that this link has been suppressed? Well, I can be summarized in two words. Safe abortion. That is the prevailing dogma. It is very strongly entrenched in society. It is still very controversial. And those who wish to defend abortion rights as, uh, in terms of its legal status are also uh, ferocious in defending abortion itself as a safe procedure, no matter what kind of evidence is raised to indicate that it is not. You discovered yourself how, how ferociously they will protect that um, institutionalized dogma of safe abortion. But let's talk for a moment about your findings. When you did this research, this meta-analysis, what did your findings begin to show? Well, they showed that uh, even after you corrected for abortion's effect in delaying the age at which a woman has her first child, which is a risk factor for breast cancer uh, to start with. In other words, if a woman is already pregnant for the first time, she's uh, in her teens or her early 20s, let's say, and she has an abortion, she is first and foremost denied the protection that she would otherwise have gotten from that pregnancy. So it's a risk factor in that sense, first and foremost. But even when you allow for that, when you adjust for that statistically or match the women that you're comparing to make sure that they have had uh, full-term pregnancies at about the same age, you see that abortion also increases risk independently. It's what we call an independent risk factor when you subtract out its effect in changing the age at first-term pregnancy. And as I think you mentioned in the introduction, the overall effect, when we pooled all the data that had been published, uh, it came out to about 30% and about 50% for those who had an abortion before a first full-term pregnancy. And that is uh, an effect that showed up in, uh, at the time, about uh, 17 out of 23 studies then extant in 1996. If we bring the tally up to date, we have a total of 37 studies which have been published around the world, 28 of which show increased risk. And in the United States, it's 13 studies out of 15 studies which actually show increased risk. As you began to make the results of your analysis known uh, through journals and through the typical means of getting these kinds of, of communications out, what was the reaction of the medical community and what was the reaction of uh, various special interest groups within the United States? Well, I'd like to just add one uh one other item to answering the previous question, if I may, and that is that our meta-analysis, is, which is how we refer to our paper in short, was the statistical part of the paper. It was also a comprehensive review which examined all of the biological evidence, the experimental evidence, all of the underlying science which made the statistical association or the statistical relationship credible. Because a statistical relationship by itself does not justify, uh, it doesn't justify inferring that the exposure in question, in this case abortion, actually 
causes the disease in question, in this case breast cancer, but there's enough biology underlying it to justify that conclusion. Now as to the reaction that our study got, it got a mixed reaction, but largely from uh, organized medicine and uh, public health agencies. Uh, they disparaged the research. In fact, uh, there was an editorial that appeared in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, which uh, largely attacked us uh, and even lied about, misrepresented what we had done in our study. Uh, there was um, such a, a hostile reaction, largely from the medical research community, that the journal in which we had published the study, which is the Epidemiology Journal of the British Medical Association, actually ran an editorial uh, published in the following issue in which the editor said, uh, quote, if you take a position which might be called pro-choice, you need also to take a position which might be called pro-information without excessive paternalistic censorship or interpretation of the data. So this specific criticism of censorship and paternalistic interpretation was uh, an objection that was raised to the way our study was greeted by a pro-choice understated Englishman, an epidemiologist uh, from the United Kingdom, from the Manchester Medical School. And I think that really uh, uh, exposes the kind of unfair uh, criticism that this study came in for. And then, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is arguably the most influential medical journal in the world, only three months after our study came out, in January of 1997, came out with a study which is still touted as the most authoritative and one which shows that there really isn't any risk after all because it was done on a million and a half Danish women and it was all based on medical records and it was uh, over 10,000 cases of breast cancer and over 300,000 abortions and gee, this really proves that there's nothing there. Well, that study uh, had so many flaws, uh, it was enough to render the entire study invalid. For example, they said in that study that induced abortion was legalized in Denmark in 1973, just like it was here, but in fact it was legalized in Denmark in 1939. And all of the women who were in their cohort, who were the older women, born in the 1930s and 40s, who had abortions, legal abortions, in Denmark before 1973, are in that study and classified or misclassified as not having had an abortion. 60,000 of the oldest women in the cohort, the group of women born during those years, that is, and most of them are among the patients who had the breast cancer. In addition, they started collecting breast cancer records in 1968, even though they didn't start collecting abortion records until 1973. That kind of putting the cart before the horse is the most outrageous violation of standard epidemiological procedure, and you would hardly expect ever to see that in any scientific or medical journal, especially not the New England Journal of Medicine. But that's the kind of research that is being put forth in order to cover up the link and say, well, the early research depended too much on women telling the truth about whether or not they had abortions. And uh, so there is uh, claims that the research was biased in one way or another, uh, anything in order to say, gee, there really is no link here. Uh, women need not worry, and that's a direct quote, women need not worry about breast cancer when considering whether to have an abortion. This is what our own National Cancer Institute says through its top scientists on its website around the world. And uh, that's where we are now. Women are still largely in the dark, even though the first published study that we documented was published all the way back in 1957 in Japan. Goodness. Can you tell us a little bit about that study? The study in Japan was a nationwide study with very carefully uh, matched groups of women looking at uh, 700 plus breast cancer patients and even more women of a comparable age from the same areas who did not have breast cancer. And they found that the women who had breast cancer had three times as many pregnancies that ended in induced abortion compared to uh, women who did not have breast cancer, which translates to an elevated risk of somewhere between 150 and 200 percent for breast cancer be Brent, among women who had an abortion. Dr. Brent, you mentioned the New England Journal of Medicine. What about some of the large medical associations, like the American Medical Association, or the uh, Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or the Pediatricians? Well, uh, I don't know that the pediatricians have a position statement on it. I certainly know that the American uh, 
uh, College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has been in the forefront of very vociferously trying to deny the evidence that's there. Uh, interestingly enough, their British counterpart, the uh, Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, although it says there's no conclusive evidence, so it kind of begs the question, does publish, does list in their guideline on the care of women requesting induced abortion a summary of the findings of our study and also a statement that they independently assessed our study and found that our study had no major methodological shortcomings and could not be disregarded. Yet, even they, alas, widely disregarded in their recommendations to doctors and their patients. You know, as we're listening to you share with us about the study that you conducted and its ultimate uh, conclusions, it's, it's astonishing to me that there is no informed consent with regard to induced abortion uh, or there's no real notification of the, the very serious potential hazards of oral contraceptives, the birth control pill. What do we need to do to help women become empowered to change the tide of this, especially as we consider the younger generation of women, many of whom, are sexually active by the time they are age 14, an unfortunate reality of our day and time, knowing that their propensity for abortion and their long-term use of the uh, birth control pill would be something that might well be unprecedented. Well, there are things that can be done individually and there are things that can be done societally, if you will. For example, there are a number of states that have been considering over the last several years uh, informed consent uh, guidelines that do require that abortion providers warn women that there is evidence of an increased risk of breast cancer. In fact, there are several states that have had this uh, in their laws and in effect for several years, including uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Kansas, and uh, Texas, at least to a limited extent. So there is some informed consent that's required by law, and uh, more action is needed to get those done on a state-by-state -state basis. Individually, uh, I can certainly invite these women to uh, call the Breast Cancer Prevention Institute. We have a toll-free number. That would be 1-866-NO-CANCER. Uh, That's 866-622-6237. Uh, and uh, we don't have our website up yet, uh, but we do have... Uh, uh, I can give out a website address that has a lot of very good current information, a lot of which I have contributed, and that's run by the Coalition on Abortion and Breast Cancer, which is based uh, in uh, suburban Chicago, and their web address is www.abortionbreastcancer, all one word, dot com. Well, I want to thank you so very much for being with us today, for opening our eyes to your study and letting us know the very real risk that exists between breast cancer, the birth control pill, and abortion. Thank you, Dr. Joel Brind. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, friends, when we come back, we're going to be back with our in-studio guest, Dr. Chris Callenborn, so stay with us. <laughs> Living His Life Abundantly presents My Soul Magnifies the Lord, a rosary meditation that will lead you into the heart of Jesus. Pray along in the car or at home. Listen alone or with others. Included are all 15 decades and beautiful meditations that offer an inspiring prayer experience. To order My Soul Magnifies the Lord on audio cassette or CD, please call 1-800-558-5452. Would you like to receive some good news in your mailbox? Each month I write a personal letter of inspiration and reflection that helps you live the abundant life and share it with others. To find out how you can receive your monthly letter or to join hands with us in our exciting ministry partner program, give us a call at 1-800-558-5452 or visit our website at www.lhla.org. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but will surround themselves with teachers who tickle their ears. They will stop listening to the truth and will wander off to fables. Don't be deceived by false spiritualities that promise great things but lead you away from truth. 
Order a copy of the New Age Counterfeit today and discern the difference. Please call 1-800-558-LHLA. That's 1-800-558-5452. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest in studio today, Dr. Chris Callenborn. He is author of this book, Breast Cancer, It's Linked to Abortion and the Birth Control Pill. Well, Dr. Callenborn, as we listen to Dr. Joel Brin share with us about his study, uh, it's amazing to me that his work could be uh, so quickly maligned in the uh, halls of the medical establishment and the research establishment, and we find that very, very upsetting. You have had the opportunity to actually testify before the FDA. Can you share with us what you testified about and what the response and reaction was? Yes. I testified in June of 2000, uh, specifically on the pill and breast cancer. And to the best of my knowledge, um, the entire branch of the Food and Drug Administration was there. I was the last person to testify that day. Uh, One woman, after she read my handout, walked out before I even gave the presentation, which is an interesting response by the FDA. But there were about 12 people from the FDA and about one or 2,000 people in the audience. And as I began to speak, the audience was listening uh, pretty intently, and I noticed the heads of all the people in the FDA, almost everyone went down, almost in shame. And... When I was done, I was one of the few speakers who got very few questions, and, which is typical because they will not really interact with you. In fact, the offer that I think I speak for um, Joel, Brenda, and myself is that we'll debate anyone, anytime, as long as it's live. And they won't do that, even the world experts, because we have so much data that we didn't do. It's actually out there. But um, when we were, when I was done testifying, in front of the FDA, the chairman said, Dr. Callenborn, what would you recommend? And honestly, I recommend that the birth control pill be taken off the market in its entirety. And perhaps one way we may see that is when large pharmacies or large um, companies, for example, Walmart, Walmart's pretty honest. They took off the morning after pill. And once they see how devastating the, the effects of the birth control pill are, I think they'll start thinking about lawsuits in regard to breast cancer, cervical cancer, all these things that women are not getting informed consent on. Are we finding more and more pharmaceutical companies producing birth control pills, or are we seeing that those numbers are shrinking while the ones who have been doing it for a long time, like ortho, remain? Right. We're seeing that companies do not want to get into the area of the birth control pill because they don't know why, but they sense something is coming. And um, we were discussing during the break about hormone replacement, which I won't, you know, get into that massively, but they're finding more and more that hormone replacement. Now, this is for menopausal women. For menopausal women, which doctors used to say was safe. Now they're saying, well, wait a minute. It does seem to cause breast cancer. It probably does worsen heart disease. And the reason I bring that up is 10 years ago, the OBGYNs were saying nothing. And now... I think in about 10 years, they will start saying the same thing about the birth control pill. And that is, if a young woman is to go to or goes to an OBGYN, what she typically hears is, this is good for your acne, this is good for contraception. Excuse me, they advertise it that way on television, that it's good for your face. That's right. And it is. It's good for your acne. It's good for contraception. Um, It decreases ovarian cancer and it decreases uterine cancer. And all that's true. So we don't try to deny that. However, what you will not hear from your obstetrician, gynecologist, or family doctor is that it increases breast cancer, probably about 40 to 45 percent if you've taken it before you've had kids. It increases cervical cancer. A study just came out that if you take it for five years and you've got what's called a human papillomavirus, your risk of cervical cancer goes up by over 300 percent. And it increases liver cancer and it works by causing early abortions. So what we do in our office is we just have little flyers, the pill and breast cancer. Sometimes we don't say a thing, and women come in, and perhaps they've come in for a cold. The next visit they'll come in and they say, I've read this brochure, I'm never taking the birth control pill again. So there's no such thing as informed consent 
and the obstetricians and gynecologists need to be held responsible, as do the pharmaceutical companies, as should our government. Hmm. Let's talk for a little bit about the U.S. involvement in this because our government, as you say, th has a, a complicity here that is very important for our viewers to understand. Well, that's an interesting point. I was just at a conference um, in California, the Population Research Institute, and there was a physician from Kenya who said there's a lot of AIDS in Kenya. And believe it, or the, believe it or not, the United States in some way is responsible for increasing the risk of AIDS as well as breast cancer because of what we do, our tax dollars, they go to Planned Parenthood, USAID, and they spread contraception, hormonal contraception, all across the globe. And if you're a small country, you're basically told by different institutions that who get money from the United States, if you don't take our money, you're not going to get other money for other things. So you have to use our birth control money if you want the rest of the money. Unfortunately, um, the pill increases breast cancer and it also increases the risk of AIDS. If you're taking the birth control pill, they've studied prostitutes in Thailand and Kenya. And when those prostitutes are taking the birth control pill or Depo-Provera, which is a long-lasting contraceptive that's injected, they have 50 to 100 percent increased risk of AIDS. So what all that transmits to is the United States government, our tax money, through things like Planned Parenthood and USAID, when we give our tax money and we pay for hormonal contraceptives, we're really spreading breast cancer, cervical cancer, AIDS, early abortions, and liver cancer. And that's really bad. If the rest of the world could sue us, we would be uh, bankrupt. Mm. Let's talk about Depro-Provera for just a moment. Now, that is an injectable uh, birth control, mm -hmm. and it tends to even increase the risks of breast cancer more greatly. That's right. Depro-Provera, otherwise known as the shot, isn't um, artificial progestin that women take every three months and so it's four times a year. And a lot of women, especially black women in this country and in Africa, are just, they're just loaded up literally with um, this Depo-Provera. And what it does is if you take Depo-Provera for two years or more before the age of 25, it increases the risk of breast cancer by 190%. And if you take it for five years and you take it and you've taken it within the last five years, it increases the risk of cervical cancer by 430%. So young black women in this country are getting breast cancer faster and earlier than white women in the last 10, 20, 30 years, and a large part probably due to Depo-Provera. As we look demographically at those individuals who use oral contraceptive or who use or who have had induced abortions. We know that demographically it cuts across socioeconomic groups, it cuts across uh, uh, races, it cuts across uh, religious uh, denominations. Mm -hmm. Our own Catholic women also uh, find themselves in the same situation because many of our Catholic women have ignored church teaching mm -hmm. about birth control. I mean, you look at this and you see how carefully Holy Mother Church has guarded and protected us and yet we've thrown uh, her mandates aside and we haven't taken them to heart and we've left ourselves wide open uh, to reaping the death that our sins bring to us. Talk with us a little bit about the uh, use of oral contraceptives and induced abortions throughout the Catholic population. Well, as I had mentioned earlier, there was a paper in the Archives of Family Medicine in February 2000 that showed that all the medicine to date shows that when you take the birth control pill, it actually works by causing an early abortion. They didn't say how often. My own estimate is every 12 to 18 months. And the reason that happens... So, excuse me, every 12 to 18 months, if a woman is taking a birth control pill, she has an abortion. That's right, if she's sexually active. Now, the reason that happened is people say, well, how can that happen because the pill stops you from getting pregnant? It does, in a sense, sometimes because it prevents you from ovulating. But the low-dose pills that have come out doesn't really pre prevent you from ovulating that often. In fact, 
seven out of a hundred women will get pregnant while taking the pill correctly every year. That's according to Linda Potter. So what that implies for Catholics is if you have a large parish and you have about 200 women who are taking the birth control pill, uh, which is not unusual, one of those women statistically will actually abort her baby once a year during Mass, which is a tremendous spiritual sadness. Um, the other thing is that the birth control pill is almost always started on a Sunday. And so when you think about it, when women are receiving the body of Christ, the same day we receive life, we start a process that kills life. And this might be appropriate today, the Annunciation, you know, in the Gospel of Luke, um, Christ was probably within the first week of life when St. John leapt for joy. And that's the period of time when these abortions are occurring, within the first week of life. You know, as you share with us, it, it makes us sit up and take notice, and I am concerned about uh, the future. I'm concerned about the present. Let's talk for a little bit about what we can expect to see happening in the not-too-distant future as a result of the exportation of breast cancer and the uh, dissemination of breast cancer here in the United States. Well, I think what we're going to see happen, and, and I should back up for one minute and say that a lot of people think that I got into this research because of a pro-life view. And actually, it's almost the opposite. I first heard that abortion causes breast cancer, and it sounded so ridiculous that I set out basically to prove it or disprove it. And that led me into the research mm. of the pill and breast cancer. But I think what we can expect is rising rates of breast cancer in the United States and Europe. Also, in China and Africa, I think we're going to start seeing that go up and we're going to see a more aggressive breast cancer. If you take the pill and you develop breast cancer, not only do you get breast cancer, you tend to develop a more aggressive type of breast cancer, according to a researcher in Sweden named Olsen. So we'll have women dying earlier, more women getting breast cancer, also more women getting cervical cancer in third world countries, and more women getting uh, liver cancer. And I think we're going to start to see tremendous pressure and some of these companies like Walmart, I think, are going to stay, take a good look and say, I think we might consider not even producing this or, or selling this. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other factors that contribute to breast cancer? And what are the best things that a woman can do, including sure. not using oral contraceptives and maintaining her pregnancy? Sure. There are about 15 to 20 risk factors for breast cancers. So just because you get breast cancer does not mean you had an abortion or took the pill. But it could. The other risk factors include a strong family history. If your mom had breast cancer. I was going to say if your dad had breast cancer, but that can actually happen. A man can get breast cancer. Um, if you use ho hormones at menopause, as we mentioned, that can increase your risk by about 50% if you take them for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Postmenopausal hormone use can do it. Drinking alcohol can actually increase your risk of breast cancer. Radiation, if you get a series of too many mammograms, if you've got an abnormal uh, number, say 30 or 50, that can actually bump your risk a little. So you do want to get mammograms. You don't want to get 20 before the age of 40, something like that. Um, those, those are some of the risk factors. Now, what can we do to decrease a woman's risk? Um, not have an abortion not use birth control pills, and we have natural family planning, why use artificial methods? Um, as I mentioned before, every time you have a child, your risk of breast and ovarian cancer go down by 10%. And we should nurse our babies for what period of time? Well, every time you nurse a child for six months or longer, your risk of breast and ovarian cancer go down 5 to 10%. Hmm. So these mothers in the old days who nursed their children had much less, much less breast cancer. Hmm. There's also a drug for women who are nervous. Let's say they had an abortion, have a strong family history. It's called Avista, I-V-I-S-T-A, Riloxifen. And you, you could take it after menopause, and that will reduce your risk of um, breast cancer by about 50%, it looks like, and it also strengthens your bones. 
Well, Dr. Chris Callenborn, I can't thank you enough for being with us today and for sharing with us about this most important topic. You have certainly opened my eyes, and I know that you have opened the eyes of our viewers as well. I want to thank you, thank you. so very much for being with us today. Friends, when we come back, Father Ed Sylvia will be with us, and he'll have his words of wisdom, so stay tuned. <laughs> If you enjoy watching the Abundant Life television program, then don't forget that you can also hear Johnette and her guests on the radio. Living His Life Abundantly can be heard every weekday, and Moments of Truth Live, an exciting call-in program, can be heard each Wednesday and Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. To order any of the television programs in the Abundant Life series, or to find out more information about the radio programs that we produce, call us at 1-800-558-5452 or visit our website at lhla.org. The fathers of the Second Vatican Council expressed an urgent plea to women. This is what they stated. At this moment, when the human race is undergoing so deep a transformation, women impregnated with the spirit of the gospel can do so much to aid humanity in not falling. To order the book Full of Grace, Women and the Abundant Life in print or on audio cassette, written and read by Johnette Bankovic, please call 1-800-558-5452. Do you believe Jesus Christ is truly present in the Holy Eucharist? Is the sacred host just a symbol, or is it really the body and blood of Christ? The Father's Gift is a new video for those wishing a personal conversion of heart. Travel the world to hear stories that will move and inspire. See rare footage of Padre Pio offering Mass, your sister Bridge McKenna and Father Emilio Tardif sharing their experiences of Jesus in the Eucharist. To order your copy of The Father's Gift, call 1-800-558-LHLA. Welcome back, friends. Father Ed Sylvia is with us, and he has his words of wisdom. So let's listen. All of us know someone who has lost a loved one to breast cancer. This brings, certainly, compassion to all our hearts. We know, though, that the difficulties, as our speakers have eloquently presented to us today, these difficulties are going to increase. We are going to face great challenges in the future. Recently, in reading some of the work that's done by Steve Mosier, who is president of Population Research Institute, I was shocked to hear the impact that all of this will have, especially on our sisters abroad, those in places where medical care is nowhere near the level that is available to women here in the West. These challenges, of course, come as a result of such things as contraception and abortion. And we know that these evils have found their way around the globe. The challenge is great. A number of weeks ago, though, I read an article on one of my favorite websites, catholicexchange.com, where Christine Franklin was speaking about having taken her daughter, Jody to their doctor for an examination. Her daughter is 12 years old and was beginning, of course, the changes that are appropriate to that time, and she wanted her, her daughter to have this physical and she left her for only a moment. But Jody then experienced the doctor speak to her about birth control. Well, it was such a shock to Jody, as well as to Christine, that both of them determined that they were going to address this question, not only to the doctor, not only in reminding them that in some way they felt violated. Christine said, remember, doctors promise to do no harm. She felt her daughter was harmed in the very raising of the question as though it were so routine, as though it were just part of growing up. Yet, in so many ways, you and I need to know, we need to address these questions in a more profound way. We need to stand up and once again declare the reasons why the church teaches what she does, that it in fact leads to life and help, wholeness, we have to challenge those who, whether out of ignorance or malice, put forward the falsehoods. May God give us strength, he who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Thank you, Father Ed, for those very good words. Friends, we have some valuable resources available for you today. We would encourage you to get a copy of today's program and to share it with every woman you know. It's number 258, Breast Cancer, Abortion, and the Pill. And it's available by contacting us at Living His Life Abundantly. Our toll-free order line is 800 558 54 Five, two. We certainly also want to offer you Dr. Chris Callenborn's book, Breast Cancer. It's linked to abortion and the birth control pill. It, too, is available by contacting us at Living His Life Abundantly. Again, the number is on the screen there for you. A good website for you to go out and check out is www.polycarp.org. And we also want to give you a reference to the number that Dr. Joel Brind suggested, 1-866-NO-CANCER. That's 1-866-622-6237. Our Sunday Visitor magazine keeps us alerted to many new and current developments. If you would like to order a subscription to our Sunday Visitor to stay abreast of what is happening in the world today, call us at 800 558 54 Five two, And, of course, we want to hear from you. Our address is there for you on the screen, 325 Scarlet Boulevard, Oldsmar, Florida, 34677. Our number again is there, 800-558-5452. Our email address is there, and we invite you to go out and take a look at our website. It's www.lhla.org. And so, friends, until we are together again, may the abundant life be yours. Thank you.